Well, good evening, everybody, and as people are still coming, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you all, both in person and online. Um, and on behalf of our administrators in Bergen, I would like to thank uh, Professor Chris Henschelwood from the Sapiens uh, Center of Excellence of the University of Bergen, and uh, Dr. Karen Neverk. Uh, very nice to have you uh, with us. Uh, we're looking forward to this uh, exciting uh, lecture today, but before we start, I would like to say a few words for people that might not be familiar uh, with the Institute. So this is a foreign archaeological school starting in 1989 uh, to facilitate Norwegian um, excavations in Tejer. Our mandate now, after 2020, where we uh, underwent a major restructuring, is to facilitate Norwegian research in Greece. Uh, we are happy to see colleagues from, uh, from Norway uh, here with us tonight. So uh, it's always very important to, to have a glass of wine afterwards and sort of fostering uh, networking uh, between the countries. I would also like to mention that we have books um, in the next room that you can uh, take for free. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, oops, oops, I did something really. And um, the floor is yours. Uh, you do the honors mm -hmm. to present yeah. uh, our speakers tonight. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor, Professor Christopher Henselwood, uh, one of the most prominent figures in the field of archaeology, particularly known for his research on early Homo sapiens behavior. Professor Henselwood serves as the director of the Center for Early Sapiens Behavior at the University of Bergen and holds the position of distinguished professor at the University of Witwatersrand. His groundbreaking research has significantly advanced our understanding of human evolution particularly through his pioneering work at Middle Stone Age sites in South Africa. One of his most renowned contributions comes from his excavations at Blue Boss Cave, where he uncovered some of the earliest evidence of symbolic thought and artistic expression, shedding new light on early human cognition and cultural development. Throughout his distinguished career, Professor Henselwood has authored over 120 papers and two books, covering a broad range of topics from early technology, and social systems to the development of language and symbolism. His expertise spans across fields such as archaeology, linguistics, and human population and uh, evolutionary biology, and his work on the effects of climatic variation on early human populations have further deepened our understanding of human behavioral evolution. Professor Henselwood's contributions have earned him international acclaim with memberships in prestigious academies such as the Academy of Science of South Africa, Academia Europea, and the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters. His current work at Sapiens, a center of excellence funded by the Research Council of Norway, brings together over 40 top researchers from Europe, Africa, the UK, and the USA. I think Professor mentioned earlier something like 32 or 33 different nationalities to explore key aspects of fairly human behavior between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago. Joining him is Dr. Karen Van, K Van Niekerk, Deputy Director and Principal Investigator at Sapiens. Dr. Van Niekerk's, Niekerk's uh, excuse me, research focusing on Middle and Later Stone Age archaeology has provided crucial insights into early human life ways, especially through her work on faunal analysis and environmental reconstruction. Her research on sites such as Clip Drift Shelter has been instrumental in advancing uh, our understanding of symbol symbolic practices in early human societies. Okay. So, let us all welcome Professor Henselwood and uh, Dr. Van Niekerk for tonight's lecture. Thank you. Oscarus, for your very kind words. I'm not sure I <laughs> deserved all of them, but thank you anyway. Um, and there yeah, also, thank you. And a big thanks to the uh, Norwegian Institute of Athens for inviting us to come here and give a talk. It's the first time I've been here. Um, it's the first time Clarence's been here. So uh, we certainly are thoroughly enjoying being back in Athens again and actually seeing the Institute. So. It's great. All right, I'm going to give you a 
a whirlwind tour in essence tonight um, of a bit of African and then Southern African archaeology. So I'm not just going to talk to you about the origins of art and symbolism, because I think it's out of context to just tell you about that alone and I'll give you a bit more background about what we do, where we're doing it and, and how we do it. So George turned on. The down one. Yes. Yes. All right. So the first slide is just really to give you a bit of background about uh, the evolution of early Homo sapiens uh, in Africa. And in fact, as you well know, some early Homo sapiens or archaic Homo sapiens really left Africa as well. This is the topic of at least 20 lectures in itself. So I'm not going to even try and, and uh, cover everything for you. But in essence, if you look at the map over here, um, some of the important early Homo sapiens, archaic Homo sapiens, um, evolving in Africa, uh, word Herta, Homo kibish, and this one down over here, I'm particularly interested in Floris, but which was originally uh, Heidel, uh, Homo heidelbergensis, and is now being reclassified as an early Homo uh, Okay, Homo sapien. So, what you've seen is a, is a distribution of, of, of early Homo sapiens, also in parts that these Homo sapiens are leaving Africa, for example, the one from Apidema, one here, and some at other sites. But those early migrations out of Africa are not successful. So, those early Homo sapiens do not survive. They get taken over by Neanderthals, and you know, and there are a number of reasons. I won't go into that now because it'll take us far too long to discuss all of that. I think the key thing is that if you look at these hominins I'm showing you here, this is this is a bit like the stream. This is the mosaic hypothesis. So you've seen a stream of genes moving across Africa and interbreeding and not interbreeding. You see terminations. You see all kinds of things happening. It's not a one-way stream that goes all the way down to modern Homo sapiens indeed, not at all. Exactly who belongs to who and who, what are, who our early ancestors are is still being debated. And it will continue, continue to be debated probably for quite some time. Um, but I'll talk to you about you know, leaving Africa now. But one of the, I think one of the interesting um, uh, Homodens over here is, is also um, one from uh, uh, Hofmeyer, and that's dated at 36,000. I'll show you a picture of it now. Um, and that is completely modern Homo sapiens. So these are the paths of uh, early Homo sapiens and archaic Homo sapiens out of Africa. So this is the movement around Africa itself, and then the big migration out is around 70,000 to 50,000. And don't misunderstand when we say this big migration. It's not a big migration at all. It's actually several groups of probably very small Homo sapiens crossing over the Red Sea or going by modern day Egypt and going into Eurasia, in some cases interbreeding with Neanderthals, uh, in some cases interbreeding with Denisovans. Um, but it's a continual stream. And the point being is that when those Homo sapiens cross over into Eurasia, they are in fact already anatomically modern and they're behaviorally modern, so both. So they are able very easily, in fact, to supplant all other hominins in, in Asia and in Europe. And that's the extension of the Neanderthals, of course, and others. What I'm going to talk to you about is how did our ancestors get to the stage that when they left Africa 70,000 years ago, that they actually were smart enough to outwit, if we're going to use that word very loosely, other hominins in other parts of the world. So some people are 
shocked when I was in Japan and I told them that everybody in Japan comes from Africa. That was the headlines of the newspaper the next day. Nobody believed me, but <laughs> I'm afraid to say that is a fact. So I like that to say no, the other side. So it's a bit, a bit cheesy, but we are Africans not because we were born in Africa, but because Africa is born in us. Okay, so if we look now at the archaeological evidence, um, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? Why did we start these investigations? Um, who has been there before us in other sites looking at this period called the Middle Stone Age, which dates from around 200,000 uh, to 50,000 years ago? What we've seen from excavations of various sites, and we'll talk about some of them now, is in essence, there was a major change in human behavior after 100,000 years ago. Something clicks, something happens. Um, we are still investigating what. I'll give you some of the information about it at the moment. Um, but there's a radical transformation after 100,000 and then down to 70,000 and then down to 50,000 again. So by the time those people left Africa, as I said a moment ago, 70,000 years ago, they were behaviorally modern and they were anatomically modern. And this system is not confined to Southern Africa. It's this found in other parts of Africa as well. And the more excavations that have been done, the more information comes out from Kenya, from other places. But it's been a very, very slow process and it's, it's extremely expensive to do these excavations. There's a picture of the Hofmeyer skull over there, 36,000 years. Um, and you can see clearly it's anatomically modern. So that's the same as the people that you see in Western Europe at 35,000 years ago. Okay. So we've been working since 1991 on Middle Stone Age sites. Karen joined me in 1997, uh, excavating at Bombos Cave and the Clift of Shelter. Um, and then we also have, as a part of our project in, in, in Bergen, uh, Professor Sarah Wertz, who's from the University of Witwatersrand. She excavated Cl Clausius River. And Clausius River has been excavated for many, many decades by earlier um, excavators, one of them being Professor Hilary Deacon from Stellenbosch University. Um, but she's making major new finds now. So after getting grants from the ERC, getting grants from the, the NSF in America, and many other grants, we decided that archaeology in itself was not answering the questions we wanted to ask. Archaeology could answer some of the questions, but there were a lot of things, there were a lot of gaps. And those gaps, we were determined to fill them. So when we applied for a Research Council of Norway 10-year grant, a Center of Excellence, in 2016, I went around the University of Bergen and approached a number of people uh, in mathematical and, and natural sciences and in psychology. Two of the top people said, we're absolutely interested. We would love to work with you. So we put together three um, faculties in the University of Bergen and numerous partners in Tübingen and other places. I'll show you something about them in a moment. And we put the application into the research council and we got it. So now we, we've got another five years left and I think we've achieved a considerable amount and I'll show you exactly how. All right, this is our structure. Um, this is a center board and you can see the top, we have our legal partners and those are the University of Bergen, of course, uh, University of Bordeaux, Norse University of, uh, of well, all the way University of London, uh, Tübingen um, and Wittbadestrand. So those are signed legal contracts we have, and those researchers work with us as a part of the Center of Excellence. Um, and then we have our departments I told you about now, the, the three faculties connected, and we have a leader group that meets on a regular two-week basis. Some of them are based in Bergen, some of them are based externally, and discuss the center and the progress of the center on a regular basis. We've been very fortunate in getting grants from the Research Council, of course, for postdocs and PhDs, but also from many other sources, from the ERC, for example. 
and a new project called SEAS, which has funded several of our postdocs. So in total, broken down into archaeology, climate and cognition, which is how we operate in now, as I explained to you earlier, we have 38 scientists, and we're very proud to say that those are from 22 nationalities. Um, so we are very cosmopolitan, and the the, the vibe in, our, in the center is, is extremely positive. The postdocs and the PhDs interact strongly with the scientists with each other. It creates a very good milieu, and when we're in the field together, we all go into the field, and we come back, we meet in Bergen on a regular basis. And this is really important for science, because this is crossing over now your different persuasions to try and find an answer to where do we come from and how did we get there. Collaborators, of course, as I said to you a moment ago, absolutely essential. If you don't have collaborators, you can't do the work yourself. You need to get some of the world's experts. And these are our collaborators in the, in the north uh, at the top. And then we have numerous collaborators um, in South Africa as well. And I just want to say the one thing that we really have enjoyed is that people are so willing and so wanting to join our research and to contribute their scientists and contribute their lab laboratories and contribute their money. So it's it's a two-way stream. You know, they get the material, they work with us, but we also work with them. So these are the three sites that we excavate in South Africa at the moment. Um, this is part of the Sapiens project. Clifton Cave and Clifton Shelter, I'll talk to you about a bit more about those now. Blombos Cave, um, you know, well known, and also Clarsley's River, extremely well known. And you can see where these sites are located. Here's Cape Town, that's the Indian Ocean, this is the Atlantic Ocean, and Clifton Shelter and Blombos Cave. A past Cape Agulhas is down here, that's the southernmost tip of Africa. And then Clarsley's River is a bit further along the coastline. Excavations in South Africa um, have been ongoing at Blombos Cave since 1991 and then again 1997. Gaps in between and then starting again. This was the last year of excavations. It was quite sad for us after 30 years. The excavations have been led by Corin Finnegan for many years now, and we had an all-female excavation team this year. We were extremely accurate and, and very competent indeed. And we had several problems in the site, as you can see down here, with, we got down to a layer, which is just basically rock. And we had to drill um, for a couple of days to get an access point, and eventually we did. And Karen and her helpers hung over like bats down this hole to <laughs> excavate bits and pieces. Um, but there were some great finds down there, and those have been analyzed at the moment. The date of those is around 110,000, maybe 115,000. But some really exciting stuff, which I can't show you now, but it will come out in, in due course. This just gives you an indication of, of the interior of Blombos Cave. Um, that's what the surfaces look like. So extremely rich, um, and everything is completely intact. So if you look over here, for example, there's some there's some ochre over here. There's a shell which contains the ochre. There's grindstones around it. And what's happened is that over a period of time, the sand blows into the cave and it covers the artifacts. And the next people come in, maybe 100 or maybe 500 or maybe 1,000 years later, they stay there, they do all their things, they leave their stuff and they go away and it gets covered again. So things are actually completely in situ. It's it's amazing. Um, and the preservation is exceedingly good. So the top you see over there, the top layer is 70,000 years old. And the bottom layer here, I think, is around about 90,000. We're not down to the 100,000 yet. Classes River, as I mentioned earlier, um, Excavations run by Sarah Wirtz from the 11th to the 30th of August this year. Um, they're down to about 120,000. They've got some interesting stalagmites in the excavation and some big uh, carnivore bones and other bones, herbivores. So they're going to excavate those. And she's very excited about some new, new finds at 
Glossy's River. This is an important site for us indeed. Um, it's also the site where the most hominin material has been found, dating from 120,000. Um, and it's an interesting combination of, of features. Some of them are gracile and some of them are not. So they kind of on the edge of becoming completely gracile homo sapiens like us. But that is pretty well the situation. At Blombos as well, we have teeth from Blombos. We have one tooth from Cliff Drift that Katarina has looked at, and they are modern. And those date to 60,000 and 80,000. We are now moving our focus uh, away from Blombos into Cliff Drift Cave, which dates to 14 to 9,000, a very interesting period, which is the last glacial maximum. This is when the sea level was 100, was 160 meters down and the coastline was 120 kilometers away. So what we're interested in looking at is to see what did people do? How did people react to climate? Uh, how did they adjust their lives? How did they adjust the eating? What did they hunt? What did they gather? Because a lot of the time when they are at the site on the right hand side, clipped up a shelter, the sea is close by. So you have all the shellfish, you have the fish, and you have other things as well. Um, at Cliptrith Cave, we think that we're going to get to a stage quite soon of not having any shellfish or anything, any marine mammals or anything else like that. So there'll be dual excavations next year with coral on the one side and one of our postdocs on the other side. And then Cliptrith Cave Lower is also very interesting. We've just started excavations in that, and that dates to over 100,000. So what exactly is in there is going to be a part of our future work there. This was Clip Drift uh, Complex, the two capes out in the shot I showed you, and this was with Joko Tankosic um, doing some planning in Asia Osgard, uh, where we're going to camp on the beach over here, and what the condition of the site looks like, and it's actually in excellent condition. We also have a, a lab in, in Cape Town. Uh, it's a Witz Sapiens funded lab. We run it for a number of years, and our researchers, a lot of them, work there um, during usually uh, April, March, uh, April, sometimes May, um, but it's open for our researchers whenever they need to. And we have two curators there dealing with permits and dealing with the material itself. So a lot of highly productive work is done in our, in our laboratory here. Okay, let's get down to some of the symbolic stuff now. And let me explain to you briefly why these finds have been important and how they've contributed to our understanding of earlier Homo sapiens behavior. Um, this ochre processing toolkit was found at Blombos. Um, it's, first of all, the earliest known use of a container. In this case, they're using... Uh, Haliotis shells. Um, it's also the oldest recorded pigmented uh, compound, which is essentially a paint. And the entire toolkit was found absolutely in situ. So the little paintbrush that they were using to dip into the, into the shell was still on the edge of the shell. And the shell was filled with a mixture of ochre, ground ochre, um, with seal fat, which came from that scapula you see over there, that heated the scapula, extracted the fat, and mixed the ochre together with it, and a liquid. We are about to find out what the liquid is, with several of our scientists working on that now. But when Francesca and myself and Karen looked at this in the lab, um, we found under the microscope tiny little lines at the bottom on the nacre, on the shell of that, of that uh, bigger hadiotis shell, it was where people had used their fingers to stir the mixture. And they, because of the small amounts of sand in, in the mixture, they'd moved their fingers around and they'd left a trace of their fingers as they did it. It's important because there are a whole lot of components to this that we suddenly realize now are extremely important for early behavior. Because what you have to do for a start is you have to have a template 
in your head a recipe, in fact, to make this. You can't just go into the cave and make a toolkit. So you have to go across the landscape to collect the ochre, to collect the shell, to collect the seal scapula, and whatever else you do to come back and to know how you make the pigmented compound and what do you use it for. So the important thing also, I think, is if you make a compound like that, what is the point in making the compound, which is a paint, if you can't explain to anybody else what you're doing because there's no language? So you have to have language to explain the function of what this thing is all about. And how do you go out on the landscape? You're not speaking in a guttural voice. You know, you're not scrabbling around looking for things. You have a template in your head. You're able to communicate with other people in your group. So this is one of the early indications of language being quite well evolved by 100,000 years ago. <clears throat> This was published in Science in, in 2011. This is one of our earlier finds uh, at Blombos. This is a piece of ochre. It has uh, engravings on it, abstract engravings, um, quite a complex pattern. You can see on the right hand side over here, um, it dates to 75,000. It's probably one of the best known Blombos artifacts, I think. Uh, indicating people could draw symbols on something and that would have some explanation that we don't know what it is but they would have known what it is and it's interestingly the first time that people are able to store information outside of the human brain in other words you can make a sign a mark a symbol and you can understand it because it's part of your cultural system. So the group that you belong to, which are probably only you know, 30 people, but over a wider area, probably you know, a few hundred at most, absolute at most, would be part of the symbolic system. So what you can do is, you can leave an artifact like that in a cave site. The next group comes down the coastline, they move into the cave site, and they find this probably on display, and they know what it means, or they know what it's there for. Well, there's some kind of symbolism behind it. What exactly? It's not clear. And then there's several other pieces we have now, which we've also published. Um, it's not the only one by any means, um, dating back almost to 100,000. So this marking of pieces of ochre um, is well, well founded in, in the earlier levels uh, and continues for a very long period of time. Uh, in the archaeological record. I went to a conference in Cambridge in 1990, uh, probably, 91, maybe. And there was a discussion about early human behavior. And the discussion said that, in essence, all modernity comes from Europe because, and then they gave a lot of reasons to the conference, because you don't find this, because you don't find that, because you don't find this, because you don't find that. So therefore, Africans were not capable of modernity, and it's all evolved in Europe, in the Upper Paleolithic and all that else. That, I'm afraid, was rather shattered when we found uh, the Saurus Krausianus beads. Those are the beads on the right-hand side over there, um, which date back way beyond 35,000, 75,000 and older. Um, there are quite a lot of them. Um, and Karen and uh, Marianne van Haren did several tests in the lab in Bordeaux, and you can see they're strung in different patterns, and they were able to tell from the wear marks and also from where the ochre was on those beads exactly how those beads were worn by people. And they were worn in different styles. So over time, the way that people tie the knots to hang those around their neck or around their arm or wherever they hung them changes. It's not just a case of hang some shells around your neck. And most of those shells also are covered in ochre. We've now found, more recently, um, a number of other shells in the Blombos site. Some of these have been deliberately uh, had holes made in them, probably for stringing purposes. 
Um, that's a published paper we published with Francesca Derica uh, last year, and that's been very well received indeed. So these little tiny shellfish, and they really are extremely small, um, are certainly not food. They've been brought into the cave from probably at least 30 or 40 kilometers away, carried there, and then a, the hole was made in them in exactly the same way with a bone tool in each one, and they were then strung and they were hung as jewelry in the essence. Um, here you can see the holes over there on the bottom left hand side. And these are some of the other shells. So people are collecting shells which are beautiful. This is the whole aesthetic aspect to the early life of these people. They're not just going around collecting shells because they have food in them. They're collecting things because they look beautiful, because they're aesthetically pleasing, and they keep them and probably transfer them to other sites as well. Um, we found these uh, bifacial points in some of the earliest uh, periods of excavations in Blombos. I found the first one in 1991. Um, We've done several investigations. We now have, I think, uh, almost 400 of them. This is only from the Still Bay levels, which date from 72,000 to 78,000. And working with uh, Vasa Amour and, and Paula Vila, uh, we did experiments on these bifacials and how they were manufactured. And lo and behold, we came up with a completely new concept. The Silkrete that is used to make these, the block that they bring to the cave, it's carried there. It is then preheated, and it has to be preheated in a very special way. You can't just throw it into the fire. You have to dig a hole underneath in the sand, cover it up, build a fire, heat the, the silkrete for a very long time, take it out, and it's much more easy to, to manage it and to produce these beautiful bifacials. And then Vincent also discovered that the ends of these are pressure flaked. So they're not just made with a soft hammer technique all the way around. When they come to the end part, they finish them absolutely beautifully in the end, but using pressure flaking to make something that, again, is aesthetically very pleasing and could be used as a knife, but also used as a, as a spear point. Um, this, the first find of similar artifacts in Europe dates from the Salutrian period, which is about 17,000, 19,000. So, I mean, this is, is 50,000 years before they were made in Europe in the same way, more or less. And then the other one that they had at the conference discussion, there's no bone tools in Africa because, yeah, I won't give you the argument again, but anyway, we've discovered many bone tools now. Um, we published several papers on these. Um, they're beautifully made, they're highly polished, they're covered in ochre. Um, some of them would have been probably bound onto arrow-like devices or spear-like devices and used in that way. Others were used for other purposes, probably piercing leather, uh, leather um, to make clothing. And then our latest find is this the earliest known drawing, um, it's a small flake you can see over there, and somebody has taken uh, a piece of ochre, an ochre crayon, and drawn a pattern, a very distinctive pattern on that. It's been truncated, it's been broken, so the pattern would have been bigger. We spent several weeks again in the lab in Bordeaux with Francesca, Cara, and myself reproducing uh, this piece, and there's absolutely no doubt that it's, uh, it's a drawing. There's no doubt that it's used uh, with an ochre crayon, uh, and we published this in Nature, uh, when was it? Two years ago. So not only are people making engravings on stone using a stone tool, they are also able to use um, ochre crayons to produce drawings, and we now have um, an expert in the, in the topic, uh, Nimias Dos Santos, who works with Francesca Derrick as investigating the potential of ochre being on the cave walls. And perhaps people actually were drawing cave paintings as far back as then. So he's got some very advanced experiments which are on the go at the moment. I'll be waiting for some of those results, but uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. 
clip of Chelter, the one that I showed you just now, we go back to that one again. Uh, remarkable finds of engraved uh, ostrich eggshell pieces uh, found by Clara Fenike, more than 100 pieces, um, beautifully engraved and quite intricate patterns. And these patterns would have been made on the eggshell like that. So people were decorating the eggshells they carried around, maybe as a personal identity, if this is my eggshell, or maybe because it just looked beautiful, or maybe they gave it to somebody else as a gift, a number of different reasons. We have also, not us, but another team who also found exactly the same engraved ostrich eggshell on the, on the west coast of uh, the Cape. And that's been also investigated and published. And some of the pieces remarkably look, the patterns are very similar. So that means that 65,000 years ago, people were communicating right across the Cape, which is a few hundred kilometers, and carrying these designs across the landscape. So this is the idea of where you, you're going to take something which is culturally significant and has symbolic meaning, and it spreads across sites across the whole region. It's not just confined to one site. So clearly, the, the ability to communicate with people over big distances is very distinctive. And the other, the other uh, tools are also found in other sites at the same time. These are these backed stone segments, completely different from what you saw in Blombos with those bifacial points. These are little crescent-shaped lunettes, um, and they were mounted. We still find evidence of the mounting on them on arrows like that. This is the first known evidence of the bow and arrow being used ever, and it's found at Harrison's port sites in Southern Africa. So this dates back to 65,000 as well. And we think now, if you look at those early Homo sapiens that left Africa 70,000 years ago, this would have been a major advance. Yeah, you can kill somebody without having to go and run off and throw a spear into them. You can use poison. You can use all kinds of things. So it's it's makes... It makes for much more efficient hunting, but also it makes for you know, better warfare <laughs> if that ever happened. You're not sure about that. All right, so just quickly go through, you know, what do we think about the new behaviors? How do we deal with these things? How do we deal with these older finds that were already published? What else do we want to do at Sapiens? Um, one of the important things with our, with our uh, ECRs uh, early career researchers, postdocs, PhDs, is field work. We've started some new excavations in uh, the little Karoo over here, which is the area outside Blombos, um, over the mountains. We've never, we've never been there before, and there's some interesting finds coming out there. Uh, Chris Miller from Tyrium is so, still sampling from, from Blombos, and Simon Armitage is doing our dates. And then we have several new uh, ECR at the bottom over here. We're starting new projects on flint napping, on, on where our raw materials came from, and also doing uh, climate studies by taking out speleotherms from Dewarp Nature Reserve. So this is the focus of our work now, climate and environment, putting the archaeological story into that, brain evolution, cognition in the human mind. That's our psychology department, led by Andrea Bender, um, looking at how did the brain evolve? Why did it evolve? Then when did counting evolve? When did language evolve? And what is, what's the evidence for that? And then using you know, test models and also volunteers to check using fMRI and a whole number of other methods. Marine component, of course, very interesting indeed. So we've been focusing on that more and more now, and then the excavation that I told you about a moment ago. Uh, our Sapiens team worked very closely with the University of Bergen Museum. This is with kids um, on exhibitions. We have a big exhibition on, on, on our work at the University of Bergen Museum that's been ongoing and has been very successful indeed. So as scientists, we believe very strongly that you need to communicate your science to everybody. Science is not a mystery. Science needs to be told to children and to people who know nothing, know nothing about it. It's for everybody. So we have had a big focus now on outreach and making these kind of, this kind of information available to people. This is an exhibition we've just opened a few a few months ago um, in Cape Point in Cape Town, um, beautifully done by Craig Foster and Petra Keane. 
And we've already had 300,000 visitors come to the site, um, including we have top people. Even our mayor takes his friends there now to show <laughs> the exhibition. He likes it so much. Into Whip Nature Reserve, which is uh, where we're going to be excavating at, at Clip Drift. Uh, an exhibition was opened here in January of this year. Um, also a beautifully done exhibition, which covers all our sites and all the background. And the kids absolutely love it, and the adults also do. And a lot of them start off and say, you know, the first question is, says, who do you think you are? And you say, you know, I'm Norwegian or I'm whatever I am. And then when the exhibition is over, the question says, now who do you think you are? And they say, we're African. So kids get very excited. And I think that because archaeology and prehistory is not on the, the curriculum as schools in South Africa, children benefit hugely because suddenly they realize that they have a past, which they knew nothing about. They just see the white past. They just see the colonial past. They don't realize there's a past that goes back, you know, tens of thousands and more. We opened a new museum now as well of archaeology. This is the old one. We want funding, and we will be opening this uh, in December of this year. So it'll be another exhibition open, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for this fascinating uh, lecture presentation of your work in South Africa. And South Africa. If you have any questions, you can ask me or Katarina or Karen. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. This was uh, super nice to see all this uh, great overview of the work that's been happening over the last few years. I was a bit curious about uh, the the new layers or the deep layers that Don Bos that you mentioned, and you also mentioned that you're actually did I understand correctly chosen? Yes, I vaguely understood correctly. But you have not yet the bedroom. Yeah. Oh, you know. Yes, we have just this little bit, uh, you can't even excavate it, and it's okay. just sand, the rest is all rocks. Okay. Yeah, and so it, it would seem that we we very much like it. the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're just waiting for a date for that. But uh, because the lower layers of Lombos are about 100 and over 100, it could be 110 or 115. But, but Katharina, to try and get the rocks out of that site now, you, the, the sections would collapse. It would be a disaster. So we can't actually do that. Anybody else? Yeah. Thanks for a very interesting lecture. I was wondering a bit about the bifacials and how you have established this uh, treat, uh, deep treatment of, uh, of the of the rock before they started uh, making okay. the bifacials. Okay. Yeah. So what happens is when you take your your raw material and it's been heated and you start flaking it with a soft hammer or whatever you're using, then it breaks pieces of the of that off. And there's a glaze that is left behind on the removals. And that glaze is only produced from heat treatment. So if you take a normal piece that's not been heated, it's much more difficult to work. It's much more difficult to flake. But a heat treated piece flakes much more easily and is actually much sharper. So you're almost creating you know, a, a different raw material to what silky is. Um, so that was also discovered during our, during our minute excavations in the, in the lab of all the points by Bosom Moore and by other people. Mm -hmm. Good point, actually. Yeah, good question. All right, the questions for the others are still there, so I was going to the microphone doesn't capture the whole room. So, any questions? If we could summarize this on the microphone, if you could please summarize any questions. Any questions we receive, we could say summarize it in a few minutes. Yeah, just repeat yeah. the question for yeah. the journal. Good, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Uh, I had a quick question before. Thank you for that, anyway. Uh, so, we, we talked about the engraved ochre. 
with the Martin's abstract art part. Mm. So uh, my question was, is the reason we consider it to be abstract art and not, let's say, a child just taking it? Uh, is it because of the large quantity fund of ochre deposit of engraved ochre, or is it like a singular find which you believe it to be? Yeah. How yeah. is the, the that's I'm sure. Okay. That's a good question. And we've had, you know, many people who didn't want it to be seen as... question first for the audience. Oh, the question was about the ochre piece and if the abstract motive were uh, intentionally produced or might have been the result of a child, <laughs> child playing with it. Okay. So that was one of the discussions we had when we first published the paper and the uh, response from a very small number of people, but I'm sure some of us know who they are, said these are doodles. Um, and doodles actually mean, it was just somebody idly scratching some marks on a, on a piece of ochre. Um, if you look at the design, in fact, it's, it's very carefully made. It's very deliberate. It has an intricate pattern. Um, the pattern is actually framed as well. So it's not just somebody who's just making some scratches on a piece of rock. But the doodle part is even more interesting because then we consulted with some of our neuroscientists who then said, well, actually, if you can doodle, then you're even more advanced than somebody who can make a mark on a piece of stone. So if there are doodles, well, it's an even better find for you then. That was the end of the doodle argument. So put that to bed quite quickly. <laughs> but a good question. Yeah, exactly. You can give it a piece of form to your boredom then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can I ask something about Globus Gate? Uh, given the richness of all this uh, symbolic evidence, do you think that uh, the gate had a, a special uh, role at the regional level, or is something that uh, that type of evidence can see in other caves as well? So we don't talk about uh, special purpose sites. Yeah. So what you're asking is Globus Cave has some kind of special meaning to the people who, st who stayed there and, and made tools there and are there any other sites that are similar. I think it did have special significance. Um, how special and exactly why is not particularly clear. Um, the one aspect which in fact Hilary Deacon brought up was that he saw this as being a workshop. It was a site where people were crafting um, beautiful tools. Uh, if you look at the number of bifacial points in a very, very small area, it's very clear that they're actually manufacturing bifacials on site. And we actually have all the remnants of the plates that have come off still lying there. So why would you, you know, go to a site and make so many bifacial points and to leave so many behind? It's not really understandable, but probably a lot of them will be taken away and given as gifts to people elsewhere. Some of the sites have disappeared um, under the water. So this is something we have to bear in mind because the coastline now was actually lower. Uh, the, what, the one still based site in Cape Town, the, another, another one we know of, is totally destroyed. It was dug out in the 1930s with a coal miner's shovel. Um, there are several other sites, Sibudu, for example, that are very significant that also have um, Bifacial points and other indications. Uh, Classy River also does. Um, Blomos is not unique. Uh, there are a number of other sites. Um, Hollow Rock Shelter. Um, so, and there's a new, a new site that uh, Francesca Derrick, one of our senior uh, PIs, has been involved in in Kenya. Um, in Kapuni Yamuto, where they found a child burial which dates to over 70,000 years old. So it's actually the oldest known bur deliberate burial of a human. So it, it is, you know, not just Blombos, but until we have more sites, it's very hard to say how special Blombos was compared to other sites. Yeah. I mean, just also bear in mind one thing, the population is exceedingly small. So, you know, if you're looking at 70,000 years ago, the estimate is, the total population in Africa is less than 10,000 people. Over, uh, you know, Africa's not a small place. So, I mean, 
people are spread out very thinly on the ground indeed. So where else they were going? I was supposed to find out. Now you can unmute yourself so you can ask a question. Or just type it in, but this is also an option. Uh, in the meantime, yes. Yes, thank you for the whole presentation. I'm not a specialist in this subject, uh, but uh, by what I know, uh, I stated, I remarked that uh, all these, the time span of this uh, remarkable cultural uh, developments has happened uh, during the last glaciation period. Uh, that is while uh, Europe and um, other parts of uh, Earth, of the Earth, uh, were covered with uh, uh, enormous quantities of, um, and the whole uh, environmental uh, patterns. And my question is, uh, can we draw a parallel between uh, these cultural uh, breakthroughs and uh, those of some uh, tribes and communities uh, which stru who struggled uh, in Europe, that is the Gravetians, the uh, Solutrians, Magdalians, uh, and so on. Okay. Okay. So essentially you're asking, is, is, there a diff is there a similarity or difference between what happens in Europe um, from more, you know maybe thirty thousand years ago. More progress uh, in Africa. Sure. Actually, the progress in Africa from a hundred thousand years ago. It's it's a good question because what has happened is that you have behaviorally modern humans in Europe already. These have come out of Africa and they've become adapted to the environment because these are smart people. They have adaptations to climate. They have adaptations to the animals they're hunting. They have adaptations to many other things as well. So people are constantly evolving their weaponry and their other systems and probably their social systems and also being separated from other homo sapiens for very long periods in Africa. So those people did not know they ever came from Africa. I mean, they evolved in Europe and then developed their technologies and their art and whatever else they did independently. But the point you know, we're trying to make is that when they left Africa, the capacity for that was already there. And some of those aspects were being displayed earlier, but they evolved into Europe, for example, the beautiful rock art that you see and you know, all these other inventions. They weren't carried out of Africa. They were evolved in situ because of circumstances. But because it was probably an advantage, some kind of advantage for a group to behave in a certain way. It's not quite Darwinian, but it's kind of, you know. Would dare say that uh, uh, 70 years, uh, uh, 7,000 uh, years before uh, present, uh, the African populations were ahead of the, the other tribes, the gatherers, etc. Well, they were way ahead of them because they were Neanderthals, in essence, and Denisovans. So these were archaic Homo heidelbergensis um, with probably, not probably, but limited you know, ability to carry out the same kinds of activities as Homo sapiens carried out. So in fact, whether the, the end of the Neanderthals was because of modern humans or because of climate or because of both, some people suggest climate, maybe Iberia was the last place they were found. Um, some even question how much interaction there was between Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens. You know, was it very limited? There was something to breed in, but how much? And then clearly, you know, Neanderthals were not coping because they were very small groups 
and they were shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until the last one probably was in Iberia. That's one of the theories now. And then there were, there were no more Neanderthals or Denisovans. But the genes are still carried in Europeans. So no African people have any Neanderthal genes, but people born in Europe and Eurasia have those genes, small percent, three, four percent. But, you know, it's obvious that that was not a dead end, so to speak. I don't know. Though. Yeah, you uh, unmuted everyone. So I think it's easier if they type with the question. I think. Hello. Oh yeah, we can hear you. Hello, Christopher. It's uh, Mark Collard here in uh, Vancouver, Canada. So good morning, or I guess good evening for you guys. Um, thanks for the great talk. I was just wondering whether um, you've been looking for uh, sedimentary DNA and whether you've had any success on that front. Yes. Hello, Mark. Good evening to you. Welcome. Um, we have tried uh, at Blombos. Uh, we worked with a team from uh, Max Planck. Uh, Matthias Mayer and Svante Pebo. Uh, we took DNA samples from Lombos. Uh, unfortunately, we found uh, no evidence of, of DNA at all. Uh, and this is from several samples. Um, we also... Sorry. We had one positive and Yes. So I was just about to say to you that Clipcliff Shelter, which is the South Korean year, back to you next year, we have one positive uh, DNA re uh, result, and we are going to go back and look for more DNA there. So we are hopeful that perhaps 65,000 or 50,000, we will get human DNA in, in those sediments. So yes, we, we, we are looking with them, and they're still working very closely with us. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much for this mind-blowing lecture, for me anyway. But you may have, well, first of all, the, the Europe and Africa have completely different have connotations in our modern minds that were not there at that time. It's a vast area which has nothing to do with Europe or Africa. It's just the world, isn't it? Um, you may be aware that in the last 20 years, there's been some finds in Greece, very surprising finds. Uh, when I was a student, there was no Neolithic in the islands, for one. Now we have Paleolithic finds in Lesbos, which go back quite a lot. So it's claimed uh, that the 70,000 years, 50 to 70,000 years that we saw in your initial um, uh, slide, of uh, the expansion from, from Africa to Europe and Asia. Um, can you comment on this? How does this fit in the, the greater picture? Katarina can answer that question for you as well. Um, you know, I think you have to realize what I, what I said earlier on about people leaving Africa at other periods of time as well. So there's no upper Paleolithic in Europe at 70,000. I mean, there is no, there is not, there is not one. <laughs> so what you might be talking about is in essence, some finds which might have related to earlier Homo sapiens who were in, in Eurasia at 100,000, at 200,000 and at other periods carrying some material, for example, in, in, in Israel, we find that today, which looks kind of, modernish but is actually you know quite old there is no upper paleolithic at that time period katarina is busy excavating the site at upper Dima now which is upper paleolithic in it and it's not seventy thousand years old okay. yes please do this is from the lower paleolithic 
it's there are no hominid remains unfortunately or in the sites that we have been excavated they are also very very old so around half a million years or so but these are associated with earlier or, or different hominids so neanderthals or neanderthal ancestors for example not uh, homo sapiens as these sites now like chris i think talking about are associated with if that makes sense yes uh, so is that possibly these these uh, groups they died out so perhaps that's exactly what happened <laughs> that, is, that is an explanation yeah. 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 because remember what, two things one of them is the group sizes of those earlier populations that moved out were exceedingly small and they were competing directly with neanderthals and you know it was not really a very i mean they, they bred with the neanderthals but it was not a it wasn't a lasting solution. But after 70,000, it's a stream of people, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years of people streaming into, into Asia with smart ideas and, you know. I suppose like a greater of population. Absolutely. Yeah, the population increases in size and the more successful they are. You know, the other thing you have to think about is the adaptation that's necessary. I mean, if, if the genitals try to go into Africa, they wouldn't have been successful because they were adapted to a totally different environment. If, when modern humans moved into Eurasia, they moved out of a mostly dry environment, but not always, into forest areas in Asia, adapted extremely rapidly. They moved into other areas, Australia by 70,000, apparently, or 65,000, and adapted incredibly easily. So this is a part of the modernity side of things, is how people can adapt to environments very rapidly. Um, and not just adapt, but actually survive and you know, keep breeding and producing more homo sapiens. Or Can anybody hear me? Cannot hear you. Uh, can you hear me, Chris? Uh, hello, to Christina. We can barely hear you. If you okay, to... I can speak up. Well, it's lovely to see you again, Chris. And the work is progressing, and I'm still very involved in the sapiens thinking and so on. People, I've given a, a few presentations, um, you know, for for the ordinary. Audiences in in Norway about this project, and and very often people think that the Stone Age people were poor and living, you know, on on the edge of an extinction and 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 fighting very much. But it's very very clear from the first time I heard you in 1999 that the Blombos people they were affluent and sophisticated. They had spare time for making these. Um, beach shells uh, things and, and to make patterns and so on and so forth. And you've been talking about this as symbolic functions and the fascination, my fascination is what kind of symbols could they, they mean? And I was also thinking you presented these um, these um, um, sophisticated um, flakes, the, uh, the spearheads and flakes. Uh, and my idea is that since there were some as you have said once, um, they were overdone for their purpose, more or less. I think that they may also had very important symbolic functions in processions or as gifts or whatever, particularly the ones with particular colors or the one that we know is clear white. And I think because these people, they had brains like ours and they had spare time to do things, I think we should not underestimate their their cognitive functions and and the, the symbolic functions of their um, of their artifacts. Thank yeah, you. For thank you. Thank you for that comment, Christina. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have worked with you closely for many years, and thank you for coming to the lecture tonight. And thank you for your comments. I think we're going to call it a day there.
Thank you. Thank you.